and welcome to episode 5 of the Behind the Beacon podcast. I'm your host, Seth Renski. Before our first interview, I want to remind all of our student-athletes that the second group of True Beacons events are coming up on the week of October 19th. There will be unique programming for each class, starting with the juniors on Monday, October 19th. This week, I will be hosting Trivia Night on Thursday, October 8th at 8 p.m. It will be a great chance to learn about Boston and members of our athletics department and also get to interact with your fellow student-athletes. Finally, UMass Boston Athletics is hosting a voter registration challenge. The team that gets the most unregistered voters to sign up to vote will win a prize. For more information, check out beaconsathletics.com. Our first guest this week is UMass Boston men's hockey alum Jim Ennis. Jim was a captain of the 2011-12 men's hockey team and has gone on to become a family nurse practitioner in Boston and a first lieutenant in the Army Reserve. He was called into duty for nearly three months earlier this year when he and his unit worked at a hospital in New York City at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. I caught up with Jimmy to talk about his experience working in Elmhurst Hospital, why he went into medicine, and why he chose to join the Army Reserve. Joined by Jim Ennis. Jim, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Seth. How are you? Doing great. We have a lot of UMass Boston alums who have worked with COVID patients, but you worked in one of the more unique places. Can you tell the story of how you ended up at Elmhurst Hospital in Queens, New York during really the worst of the coronavirus pandemic in New York? I'm a family nurse practitioner, and uh, I typically work for Mass General Brigham uh, in the urgent care setting. And I uh, also am a member of the United States Army Reserve. And uh, part of the reserve, uh, as many people know, were activated um, during the COVID pandemic. And early on in April, I received a phone call from uh, one of the main medical units who uh, basically told me that I was assigned to them and that they would be going uh, somewhere, didn't know where at the time, uh, to serve COVID uh, patients. And uh, ultimately, we ended up in New York City at Elmhurst Hospital. And that's sort of where the the journey began. What was that experience like? New York obviously was hit really bad right in the start. You were there for two and a half months and doing a little bit of research. Elmhurst Hospital, very diverse population, was hit hard and didn't have the resources of some of the other hospitals described as the epicenter of the epicenter. That's not somewhere most people would want to go. Yeah, it was a very interesting um, situation that we sort of came upon. Um, The Army did a really great job of identifying some of the hospitals that needed additional help. And uh, we were reallocated from the Javits Center, which was a temporary hospital at the um, convenience center there, that basically uh, they sent us out to community hospitals. And in the community hospital, Elmhurst was one of the hardest hit uh, hospitals. Uh, basically, the demographic around the area, it's in Queens, and it's a very culturally diverse population. And just based on the density there with a virus like COVID uh, and people that typically rely on public transportation, such as the transit system there, uh, I think a number of people got sick all at the same time. And sometimes there's different you know, culture beliefs about going to the hospital and things like that. So um, that was one of the things that was very interesting is that uh, people came in different different levels of sickness. Ultimately, um, some populations, um, you know, tried to do self care, which at the time was a lot of the recommendation from state and public officials to sort of do self care at home, Tylenol, Motrin, that type of stuff. Um, but ultimately, they got sick pretty quick and ended up coming in when they needed to be intubated or you know, a higher level of medical care, which is not uncommon, but more uncommon in the volume. Uh, that was happening. And so we, the Army folks, were uh, in the emergency room for the first two weeks, sort of triaging patients and determining um, who needed to be admitted, who needed care right away, who needed to be intubated. So a lot of different things. It's very typical of an ER, but just more the the volume of patients uh, was very atypical. Was there a culture shock for you and some of the people who are coming in, first off of realizing just how bad this was, but also being so different from what you do on a day-to-day basis in Boston? Yeah, I work in urgent care, so many of the patients are stable in terms of when they walk in. You know, we're dealing with uh, some unstable patients that need to be routed to the emergency room, but, um, you know, coming uh, to an ER during a pandemic is certainly one of the highest acuity events that I've ever sort of worked in, 
And we had great, you know, additional staff. We did have staff and, and docs that worked in the ER typically. So we had a lot of help uh, from them. Uh, but mainly the, the level of sickness of these patients requiring intubation um, was very uncommon. I would say that most people either needed intubation right away or within a few you know, days of admission. It just kept getting worse and there was not you know, sort of treatment um, at the time and still to this day. I mean, the treatment is sort of more you know, conservative. There are some treatments that have been FDA approved that can help, um, but there is no quote unquote cure. Um, for a treatment for COVID. So, you know, mainly it's trying to figure out what, what's going to happen to these patients and how do we best treat them. And so the treatment plan is also, you know, difficult with a novel disease like COVID. Uh, we saw people with, um, you know, their blood clotting, you know, which is not very common with many viral illnesses. Um, just lots of different things and nuances to this disease. It was very difficult to control in the first several weeks without knowing um, the full picture of how to, how to treat this disease. So with that, outside of intubating and doing some of the things that actually proved to be effective, what were you looking to do to make these patients uh, a little bit calmer, a little saner, trying to keep their level of, of being a, as high as possible? Yeah, so basically um, some of the things that we had uh, employed right away were um, we had a mental health team, and our mental health team um, would do video chats with family members because unfortunately they couldn't visit um, with COVID being so high in the community, there was no visitor policy. So a lot of the times when you're dealing with patients that are admitted to the hospital, it's a, a psychological um, roller coaster for them. They get admitted, they're very sick, they may not be thinking right, they may be delirious, uh, but having the ability to see family and, and talk with them often helps in, in, a, in a personal way to be able to connect uh, with them. And it helps the providers too, to be able to communicate with family and keep everybody in the loop in an environment where you're, you know, communicating um, over apps like um, WhatsApp and, and FaceTime, which is very unusual um, ways to communicate with families and things like that. What was your day-to-day -day like? And how do you, as a healthcare professional, stay sane yourself during that, where it's not like, you're going back to family and also you don't maybe have some of the options to keep yourself saying that you would during a normal non pandemic scenario. So one of the main things is that when you're working in healthcare, I believe strongly that you need to be able to be very creative to take care of yourself. And that includes mental health. And so whatever it is that you, you know, need to do to help yourself, whether that's through exercise, through meditation, through other, you know, avenues, then you need to make sure that you're doing that specifically because you're spending most of your day. And I personally um, sort of put the patient first. And so whatever needs to be done during that 12 hours of shift, I'll exhaust every resource to take care of that patient. And being stuck in a small hotel room in New York City uh, with not a lot of access to exercise, I still was able to sort of exercise in the room, just knowing that that's what I do personally to help me um, you know, stay sort of uh, uh, sane, and especially when you're sort of cooped up and un unavailable to sort of travel around New York City, which would be typical if you were you know, working there. Jimmy, a big reason that you're in this field is because of something that happened to you in terms of your health at a young age. Can you, for the people who don't know, uh, talk about that event and how it's kind of changed your focus in terms of finding a career path and, and finding something that you can give back because people were able to help you. Yeah, I think sometimes people are shocked to hear that you know, I finished up my, my college hockey career uh, and then became a nurse and then ultimately a nurse practitioner. But uh, my story is that when I was 13 years old, I was diagnosed with a brain tumor. It was accidentally found while playing hockey. I was hit uh, on the chin and had uh, what now, you know, I would, I would call a concussion. I just wasn't feeling right. And uh, my parents noticed that I wasn't acting appropriately. So they brought me to the hospital and in the hospital, they ended up doing a CAT scan, which showed, showed the brain tumor. So um, I had treatment at Children's Hospital with a wonderful uh, staff there, including nurses, doctors, and other healthcare professionals. And that was something that my whole life sort of stuck with me. And uh, I always wanted to play college hockey. And I asked them, you know, my mom will joke. Uh, the first thing I woke up after surgery was like, can I play hockey, you know? And so after finishing my college career, I, I thought about, you know, what would I do and I thought about physical therapy and, and athletic training and things that sort of came along with the sports world. 
Uh, but I actually reached out to uh, Dr. Michael Collins, who's the chancellor of the medical school, who had uh, an affiliation with UMass Boston at the time. Uh, and he sort of opened my eyes to different, different avenues. And um, they have a wonderful graduate school of nursing there. And I sort of joined that program and, and I, I became a registered nurse, worked at Brigham and Women's Hospital for a while, and then went back to become a nurse practitioner. And I'm actually still there. Uh, finishing up my my doctorate of nursing practice dnp and i'll graduate this upcoming summer well congratulations on almost getting there thanks Let, let's talk about the decision to go into the army to take it a step further what pushed you towards that and does the team focus of being in the military especially working on a medical brigade does that kind of bring you back to your days of playing playing hockey where it really is such a team sport and you can't do anything without the other couple guys on the ice. Absolutely. Um, the big thing about army is, is teamwork. And, um, I was very fortunate to be able to be with a wonderful team. Um, we were uh, mobilized to New York city, but the decision for me was easy. I always wanted, uh, to serve in the military and it just wasn't sort of an option while playing hockey, uh, and then finishing graduate studies and the uh, reserve option is is a wonderful option for medical folks who want to you know learn more about the military part of things and become part of a, a bigger team and have opportunities to do uh, different things uh, the example obviously is is being mobilized to new york city it's a it's a pandemic you know a wonderful opportunity for u.s citizens who are sick it's very different than your typical you know, deployments overseas um, taking care of ju uh, just soldiers, this was an opportunity to ca take care of soldiers and civilians, which um, as far as you know, we understood it when we were there, it was the first time that the Army Reserve had been mobilized within the United States. Typically, that's more of a, um, a, a guard, a National Guard responsibility state-wise. So it, you know, it was the first time for, for that to happen. So it's sort of part of history that I'm really honored to be a part of and to be able to do work that I love as a nurse and nurse practitioner. And serve my country at the same time i really can't think of a better option i really have enjoyed my time um, in the military thus far and i've learned a ton that that i wouldn't have learned necessarily in the civilian role you obviously were a part of history how did your family feel about you being a part of history especially being a part of history where they they didn't send you to maybe the outskirts of the the pandemic they sent you to the heart of it uh when you were in new york I think my family's very proud. I, um, I came from humble roots from Rosendale, and both my parents have worked really hard to instill a work ethic in me. And I, I hope that, you know, I made them proud by doing the work that I do, and, and I truly love it. I love helping people. Uh, I love leading people, educating people, um, being a mentor to, to younger nurses or people, you know, in playing sports at UMass Boston. People have reached out to discuss sort of my path and what's helped me. And I think that's the biggest thing about being a leader is, is being a mentor and being able to give back to the community that's helped you so much. I mean, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for a lot of the guys I played with myself who I learned from and, and still to this day have a relationship with, guys that were in my wedding, um, you know, friends to this day. So it's, you make lifelong friends playing college hockey, and, and, uh, and I'm very fortunate to, to have that opportunity. Well, that brings me to my final two questions. First, I want to talk about um, the one memory I'll always have of you playing hockey, which was your senior day game. You weren't a big time scorer. I think it was 17 goals in 77 games, yeah. but a hat trick on senior day. What does that moment mean to you? Especially there were guys who always knew they were going to play college hockey for a time there. It was very much a question mark after your surgery. So what did that mean to you? to be able to score three goals, a big one, the team was making that late playoff push, trying to earn a home ice game in the first round of the playoffs. It meant, it meant everything to me. I mean, I mean, in the, in the locker room shortly before we usually give, you know, go around to the seniors and, and give a speech about, uh, about, you know, what, what it's meant to them to play here and, and everything like that. And for me, um, you know, I was overcame with emotion. You can ask the guys in the room. I'm not, so the most emotional guy, but, but I was overcome with emotion because it meant so much to me to reach that sort of pinnacle, um, to be able to set your mind to something, to accomplish it. And, uh, and that was looking back, that was my first you know, actual leadership role. And to be a leader among some of your best friends and, and, and players, 
uh, it was a big honor. And so that one moment was super important for me. And then to go out and to, to be fortunate enough to, to put three in when I'm not necessarily a goal scorer by any means. Uh, it was one of those things in your life where you'll never forget. I look, I look very fondly on, on that day. Finally, hopefully this is the toughest question in the interview. Can you name one guy that you really enjoyed being your teammate during your time at UMass Boston? I'm sure there's a dozen, maybe even 20 plus guys, but can you maybe single out one guy to Max uh, who you really enjoyed being teammates with uh, during your time as a Beacon? Oh, that's a really hard one. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to elaborate more. I can't just name uh, one or two guys, but I think uh, I would say uh, the senior core that I played with, uh, there was quite a number of, I think there was nine of us and we grew up from day one when, um, the team was sort of, a lot of guys came in to fill roster spots and a lot of guys had left and that core remained the same. And I, and I truly believe that that's sort of the stabilizing, um, force that allowed the Beacons to get better and better under, under coach Belisle. Um, so that's sort of my, my sneaky, uh, answer to that question is that I really do enjoy, uh, or did enjoy playing with, with that senior core for four years. It was a terrific core. And I do agree that definitely started that run of playoff success that has still carried over to this day. Jimmy, it was great catching up. Uh, it's awesome hearing about your story and we hope you continue to good luck finishing up your studies and hope you continue to do great things. Thanks, Seth. I really appreciate it. That was my interview with men's hockey alum Jim Ennis. Jim is back in Boston working as a nurse practitioner and is set to graduate with his doctorate in nursing practice this upcoming summer. Before we get to our next interview, I'd like to dig a little deeper on one of the On This Date posts from this past week. On October 1st of 2019, women's tennis recorded a pair of program firsts in their match against conference foe Bridgewater State University. The Beacons rallied from a 4-3 deficit to earn their first ever win over the Bears in 15 all-time meetings. The victory also marked UMass Boston's seventh straight win overall, which set a new program record. Those are just a pair of firsts in program records for the women's tennis team last season. As a group, they won the most matches and conference matches in program history and earned the team's first ever postseason victory. Hopefully the team will be back on campus soon and able to make some more history. Now let's turn to our second guest. Lacrosse junior Dara Fahey has a lot of things he's excited about. The junior attack was part of Lacrosse's big three this past spring. They combined to record prolific offensive numbers during the team's 4-0 start. He's also a member of the UMass Boston Student Athlete Advisory Committee and is studying to be a teacher. I talked to him about all three of those topics and why he's so excited about them during our chat. I'm joined by UMass Boston Lacrosse junior Dara Fahey. Dara, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, enjoying my day. How about yourself? Can't complain. Dara, first I want to start uh, talking about one of the more successful starts to a season in UMass Boston lacrosse history. What was the spring like for you? It was a rocket of a start. 4-0, outscoring teams by almost 15 goals a game. It seemed like it could have been uh, one of the best seasons in program history before the pandemic hit. And things worked out pretty well for us in the spring we were able to do some pretty special things although you know the pandemic hit and that was kind of uh frustrating in a way but once again it's just a bump in the road and you got to get around it but you know I think once again the chemistry you know we're a very tight-knit group um we were very close at the time um you know after practice we were shooting around a lot and I think for me personally with the offensive guys I think we were all just on the same page. You know, our freshman year, we weren't really as close as tight knit of a group. And um, there wasn't much, um, you know, accountability, I would say, between the players. Um, I think t Coach Tyler Lowe does a great job. Spencer Lowe, um, they do a great job kind of uh, commanding us and holding us accountable to the standard that, you know, we need to have to be successful. But at the same time, you know, the players have to hold each other accountable. And, we just didn't do that good of a job about it my freshman year. So that was something, you know, we really focused on coming into my sophomore year and the 2020 season. Um, you know, but within the players, I think, obviously, we had some talent. We had a great freshman class come in. Um, we didn't lose much guys. I understand on the defensive side we did. And that was going to be kind of a question mark coming into the season that I think we had guys step up, obviously. As you notice, we 
you know, we held a lot of teams to little to no goals, which was, you know, amazing. I'm so proud of the group um, that we have. But, you know, with that being said, I think um, we had talent coming in, which was big. And all it was was just mending that talent, mending that talent together. It's just a good group of guys. I'm really happy um, with the group I'm with and, and, you know, the way that we kind of did things to start the season. But once again, you know, with everything that happened, you know, it's just motivation for the for this season coming up. So I'm really excited to see what we can bring to the table this year. Gavin Admiran, Connor Lenfest, Dara Fahey were nicknamed the big three last year. At what point did you think, whether it was a practice or maybe a preseason scrimmage, that you guys had something special? Because you look at the numbers, not only the offense put up, but just the three of you, you're all in the top 30 in the country in a lot of different offensive categories. And who knows how long that would have lasted, but putting up astronomical numbers as a trio it wasn't just one guy who was doing really well offensively so I think my freshman year um Lenfest being such a talented player I mean unbelievable shooter um can use both his hands really well has an unbelievable lacrosse IQ um and when it came down to our freshman year him and I along with you know a lot of the guys in the offense weren't really playing on the same page um, myself included, I played a lot of individual lacrosse my freshman year and it just wasn't, you know, the way I wanted it to be. But coming into the sophomore year, me and him talked a lot um, about our goals and kind of just got on the same page of how we wanted to play. And then when I heard about Gavin transferring, I was super excited, but I didn't know what to expect. I'd never, to be honest, heard anything of him. He's from Marshfield. I'm from Walpole. Um, but we never really saw each other play when he was in high school. And when I was in high school, so I didn't know what to expect. And um, when he got on the field and I saw him play, I was like, this is going to be fun. Like, that was just the kind of the first thing that came to my mind. I mean, his stick skills are unbelievable. He's got such a good first step and great footwork. And um, he just loves to put the ball in the back of the net and make plays. So, you know, when you kind of put us three together, um, some exciting things could happen. But once again, with that, there's always, you know, some – mistakes that aren't really great looks you know we take risks a lot but um I don't think there was any specific time where like I was like wow like this is this is going to be something special I think you know we started playing together and once again it builds up over time and then you know when the first game hit and we started you know um putting balls in the net and you know getting some points I think it it, it felt right and that's what I was really excited about and I mean once again all, res all due respect to the other teams we played this year in our first four games, but, you know, we're going to be playing a lot better talent than that. We didn't get to play the LEC games that we wished for. And, you know, that, you know, that made me upset. I know it made Gavin upset and Lenfest, along with all the other guys on our team. And I think not knowing, you know, what could have been obviously isn't exactly ideal. I always try to keep guys level-headed. I know um, we have a lot of leaders on this team and they try to keep guys level-headed, you know, that we don't know if we're that good. You know, we statistically look great, but we weren't playing the best competition, you know, and there's a lot of teams that are doing things that we do that play against really good competition. So once again, always got to be humble and just kind of realize that we still have a lot to prove. And I think that's why I'm so excited about this season is that, you know, we can prove a lot. Another place that you're taking a leadership role is the Student Athlete Advisory Committee working a lot with the Hope Happens Here organization. Can you talk about some of the things that SAC and specifically focused on uh, Hope Happens Here. You guys are focused on this fall when the students are remote and maybe it's a little bit harder to do that typical stuff you would do on a game-to-game -game basis. My freshman year, Hope Happens Here was introduced to me um, going into the spring semester. I was asked to be a part of it. I didn't really have much, you know, background with mental health uh, experience, but you know, I thought it was something that I could be a part of and be a part of the learning process. And, you know, I literally have no regrets. And it's something that's been, I'm really proud to be a part of. And, um, you know, ending the stigma of regard, like surrounding mental health is so important because you never know when guys are going through it, guys and girls could be anyone. Um, and that's, I think, you know, the scariest thing for someone who's going through it is, you know, it can happen at any point. So that's been really the biggest cause for, um, what we're trying to do here, um, especially this semester, last semester, we with COVID and the pandemic happening, you know, it, it 
has has an effect on a lot of people. So um, our goal this semester is really just to raise as much awareness as possible, keep everyone in the loop of what's going on with, you know, their family, their friends, people they don't even really know that well, just so they can be a helping hand. And once again, I'm not a medical professional. I'm not a doctor. Um, you know, the people that are doing this with me, um, they're not doctors either, but our goal isn't to, you know, be the medical help they need. It's to get them that help that they need. So we have a lot of things planned. Um, social media is going to be huge for us. So if you guys who are watching get a chance, um, if you have Instagram, follow UMB SAC on Instagram. We're going to be posting a lot about um, mental health information regarding anxiety, depression, um, things like that. And then we're going to be trying to be an outlet for those who need the help that they need. Um, connecting people with sports psychiatrists, not even beyond sports, just counselors, therapists, anything like that. Um, and one event that's going to be coming up the weekend of um, October 17th is um, Hope Happens Here is doing a um, 5K, a virtual 5K um, that I'm going to be really trying to promote on campus um, within all, all the athletic programs and teams and beyond that too, um, to everyone on campus. Because once again, uh, mental health isn't just an athletics problem. It's, a, it's just a people problem. So that's kind of the way that I see it. So I'm going to be getting a lot more information out about that. I'm going to be sending emails to teams. Um, I've been working a lot with Megan and Liam Cavanaugh, who was the director of uh, operations for hockey a couple of years back, who has a podcast, Never Give Up Radio. Um, and he deals a lot of, um, with mental health, his experience. And, you know, he's just a super nice guy, um, really down to earth. And it's just like like myself, but he does a lot better job of it, uh, you know, raising awareness and ending the stigma. So I look up to him and what he does. And, you know, it's just, it's just something I, I really am proud to be a part of. Well, that sounds like a lot of great stuff that UMass Boston student athletes can certainly get involved with and hopefully get the help if they need it. Lastly, Dara, I want to talk about your tract of study or your field of study. You're studying history, but with the intention of being a teacher, you have a brother who's a history teacher right now, um, looking at the world we're in where uh, obviously knowing a lot about what's going on in this country and what's going on in this country is, is a, as important as ever. Uh, but also teachers are kind of in that frontline role where it's a little bit more difficult this year than it ever has been before. What is maybe viewing what your brother's been doing, but also viewing what's going on in the country do to motivate you in terms of wanting to be a teacher or kind of give you insight into maybe the career that you want to pursue? I just, I just respect teachers so much. I mean, for what they're going, what they're going through, obviously like any frontline worker, we're dealing directly with the pandemic and everything that's going on. Teachers have to deal with, you know, and not even have to deal with work with, I would say, I, I don't like the term deal with because it's not a burden at all. You know, when you sign up to be a teacher, you want to change lives. You want to influence these kids. And you want to make them better people because, once again, that's the goal is just influencing the next generation of people to be good people. And, you know, it goes beyond just like the subject of teaching history for me. It's, you know, life lessons, things like that and all the sorts. So, you know, just, you know, just appreciating what they do. And I think that's why I am so determined to be a teacher because I just want to help people and I want to help the next generation of you know kids and students and learners so they can grow up you know just to pass on the torch basically so um you know i really am proud of what my brother's doing right now um along with all the teachers that i've had and i think it's something you don't really appreciate when you're younger you think they're more of a burden and they're just trying to get you in trouble and stuff but you know when i grew up <laughs> which was only recent ago um i kind of you know realized what they're doing and i i just appreciate it and you know i'm it's just something I really am looking forward to in the future. Dara, it was great getting to, to learn a little bit more about you and hear some of the excitement and energy you have for the things that you're working on. Can't wait to be, can't wait to see some of the stuff this semester and also hopefully see you back on the field next semester with the lacrosse team. It was great catching up. I really appreciate it, Seth. And I uh, uh, just can't wait to get on the field itching, you know, so I uh, appreciate this conversation and uh Thank you very much.
That was my interview with lacrosse junior Dara Fahey. To find out more information about what UMass Boston SAC is doing, check out their Instagram page at UMBSAAC. That's all for Episode 5 of the Behind the Beacon podcast. Make sure to tune in next week.